So we're very glad to have Nia Khan from Academic in Seneca, who's going to tell us about Motivic Sheaves. And it's a two talk sort of uh, series. And uh, it's kind of experimental because he's going to try to really uh, explain to the rest of us, uh, especially people farther away, really how to think about these things, which are ending up being uh, a part of lots of exciting stuff that's happening. So. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks so much for the, the invitation um, to give this invitation. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess so it'll be two talks and then um, the, so the first talk will be quite, you know, I, I will really try to be as accessible as possible and kind of not even use any advanced machinery and so on. And then, you know, in the second talk, I'll be a bit more, you know, honest about, um, you know, some of the the technical machinery that's going into this stuff and um, especially into Wojewalski's work. But this talk will be sort of more of a like motivation as to, I mean, yeah, the, the goal will be to try to convince you that motives and motivic sheaves especially are something that would be useful. Um, yeah, so, so the beginning of the story is um, like always in algebraic geometry, we're trying to, um, understand solutions of systems of polynomial equations, right? So, you know, here um, it starts with something that Leo was looking at, which is uh, you're working over a finite field. So here, say P is a prime, but most of the story you can, you know, you could take a power of P. So let's say you have some smooth projective variety um, and you're looking at this, you know, the solutions with coefficients in Fp to the Q f to the k and let's let's call n k just the the number like how many of those there are so that that's sort of the the object that Bay was interested in trying to to understand um so the idea is okay you put these into some generating series as one does okay and um so this is a sort of a zeta function um which is just the exp of this generating series. Okay, so we, we've put all these things we're interested in into one huge generating series, and that's sort of the thing we're trying to understand now. Um, so what you know what uh, they did was he sort of looked at analogies with you know algebraic geometry over finite fields was a very like you know immature uh, subject at the time. I, you know, from my understanding. And not really too much was was known about like what what really is going on there um, compared to like algebraic geometry with complex numbers. And so what um, was surprising, I think, about these conjectures of A was that actually there's you know there, there's a lot of um, you know intuition or there's a lot of analogies we can get from from that setting, and it's not actually that you know it's it's more close um to to that then we might a priori expect and so one of the conjectures that he extracted by you know considering these kind of analogies was the rationality uh, property of this function so you know there's more precise yeah i will not try to give the most precise version of all the statements in this uh in this talk but just to kind of give a flavor of what we're interested in here so we we want to say that you know you have polynomials and integral coefficients, and you know there's some n n here is a dimension of x, and you have some kind of form of these things, and there there's something more specific, you know, more explicit than one slightly more explicit one than one can say about these polynomials here, but uh, you know for me I'll, I'll say that the you know the first kind of property is this rationality. Um, and the second property that I'll talk about, I mean, there's more to whale, conje whale conjectures, but these are sort of the main things that I want to talk about in this talk. The second one is the analog of the Riemann hypothesis. And that states that if we look at the, you know, reciprocals of the roots of these polynomials, then they have absolute value um, given by just this. So for i greater than zero and less than two n. So there's some, you know, analog of the of the usual Riemann hypothesis. Yeah, so 
so I, I'll just focus on these two properties which I'll call rationality and the Riemann hypothesis. And um, so I, basically I'm gonna try to go through, you know, kind of mostly chronologically, um, yeah, starting from starting from these conjectures, how you know cohomology cohomology theory basically unfolded in algebraic geometry, and how that led to to motives eventually. Um, so, kind of the first key observation that that they made was that um, you, if you look at the Frobenius uh, on X, then you can actually identify this set as uh, the fixed points in the, you know, you can, if you choose an algebraic closure, F e bar, and you look at solutions with values in there, then you can actually identify these with fixed points of the Frobenius iterated and uh, so it should be K times. Could you just remind us what the Frobenius um, map on X is? Yeah, so let's say if, um, you know, for example, let's like locally, let's say X is affine, then on the coordinate ring of, um, of x, it's just sending x to the x power, uh, x to the uh, pth power. So it's just the, yeah, just the sort of you know, the usual thing you would call for Venus, I guess, in this setting. Um, yeah, so um, did that, like, yeah, let me know if that, I don't know who answered the question, so I can't. Uh, That's great. I got your face. Oh, okay, I guess, yeah, okay. <laughs> There, there's there's two candidates. I just wanted to make sure I knew which one you were working. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess what Norveo did was like he, you know he looked at this situation and just started wondering, well, this the fact that we can you know identify this with some kind of fixed points means that what we're trying to count is is fixed points of some endomorphism. So um, there is a way to count fixed points. There's a formula for fixed points of endomorphisms, um, at least, you know, in, in yeah, sorry. So with, with the H upper I of X, I think you want H upper I of X uh, extend scalars to the algebraic closure? Yeah, so here um, I'm actually just saying like the classical, you know, this is sort of the classical Lush's formula for let's say X is like a topological space, like, oh, you know, okay. or like, like a, like a smooth manifold, compact smooth manifold or something, uh, just to sort of, you know, this is this is what, this is the formula that Wei was looking at. Um, let's put it that way. So F is some endomorphism, right? And and we're looking at, we're saying that you can actually compute the fixed points, the number of fixed points, uh, you know, if you count with multiplicities and so on. You can compute this in terms of the, you know, the induced action of the of that endomorphism on cohomology. So this gives you a cohomological way of, of computing these, these fixed points. Um, so yeah, so there was just like, um, you know, extremely optimistically considering the situation in algebraic geometry at the time, you know, he was just like, well, what if, what if you could do this in, in positive characteristic? Um, and uh, I mean, the first, the first, the, yeah, I mean, the first problem is what, what does cohomology mean? Um, so, you know, that, that was not really, there was no like cohomology theory that he could use at the time. But what um, he realized was that in the case when X is just a curve, you should, whatever the cohomology of C is, um, you know, so, so it's a curve over a finite field, whatever the cohomology is, you should be able to write it somehow in terms of the Jacobian. And um, in fact, somehow he, he, you know, he, he knew exactly what, what the cohomology should be. And, and so he, you know, he, the Jacobian was something that he could make sense of. And so he did that and, and sort of, I mean, that's also sort of kind of an understatement because it took, I mean, he had to rewrite the whole foundations of, of algebraic geometry uh, one time just to, just to be able to define rigorously the Jacobian of something in positive characteristic, which was also not really possible at the time. So, you know, just to, just to like make sense of this sentence, he had to do, um, you know, like a crazy amount of work, but um, but he did, and um, and he he realized that this this kind of proof strategy can be made to work using the Jacobian as a kind of replacement for for the cohomology. Um, so yeah, so so he he proved a kind of fixed point formula 
for the Frobenius acting on the Jacobian. Um, and then, so, and he, he, he deduced this rationality conjecture for the, for the curve from that property. And then he also showed that, um, you know, this a certain other property, which is that um, you have a certain involution on the endomorphisms, the, you know, tensor Q of this Jacobian. Um, and that, that involution is positive definite. And he was also able to derive the second property, this Riemann hypothesis, uh, for the curve using using that thing. More generally, this kind of strategy works for abelian varieties. And then you, you, he's kind of saying that if you have a curve, you can you can look at the abelian variety associated to it, the Jacobian, and apply the apply the result for that and deduce it for the original curve as well. So that's kind of amazing. Um, that you know that he was able to carry this out but it's still only for curves um so growth and his you know his his whole school came along and um so especially growth and and michael arden showed that you can actually define cohomology for for a positive characteristic uh for a variety in positive characteristic satisfying you know all the usual formulas like functor duality finite formula and most importantly, this uh, Lefschetz trace formula or Lefschetz fixed point formula. Um, and uh, then they were just trying to trying to do the analog of this in that uh, in that setting, right? And so there is something like, okay, so what? I mean, we have to be a bit precise here because because what does this cohomology mean? Well, this really stands for the Ital cohomology of uh, x bar which means uh, base change to the FP bar and uh, with coefficients in QL, where L is a prime uh, different from P. So um, that's one thing that's gonna be a kind of problem in using this theory is that it's never gonna give you, you're never gonna be able to get like the full conjecture, at least a priori is gonna be difficult to, to extract the full like the conjecture just from from this statement, because there's always going to be a question about independence of L. Um, but okay, I mean that's that's still pretty good. Um, I mean, so just to say, like you know, Ital cohomology. Um, just in case someone hasn't seen it before, I mean, the idea is just de define cohomology using a different topology, and um, that topology is a, a sort of finer thing called the Ital topology. Somehow, the Zariski topology is not good enough for this, but yeah, there's also a huge understatement because to make sense of this Ital topology, you need to develop all this machinery of um, sites and growth and topologies. But yeah, I mean, these guys were just amazing and they, well, yeah, that's, they seem to be able to do whatever they put their mind to. Um, so yeah, so, so they were able to do this and then they were able to prove this rationality for any smooth projective variety X with the only, only issue that okay these polynomials we wanted them to be to have integral coefficients a priori they only have QL coefficients uh, so it will be useful for us to understand um, you know to understand this a little bit more precisely so the first thing is okay this number that we were counting the number of points um, in FP to the K uh is given by an analogous formula to, to, to what we had before so yeah we have this um yeah we're, we're looking at the nth iteration of the probenius and the pullback on cohomology where now cohomology again is this you know we base change to the algebraic closure and uh, we take a top homology and elatic coefficients so elatic cohomology and and then what they prove is that you have this kind of yeah, this rationality property. Um, and the, these these uh, polynomials appearing here are, um, you know, basically these, these guys here. So they're, the, you know, given by the, this, this formula. And HI again means uh, this shorthand for this. Yeah, so that's uh, what they proved. But yeah, so let's look a little bit at, you know, into the proof, um, kind of try to understand what, what, yeah, what, what's going on there? Um, so one one thing that's really interesting about this argument is that 
um, I mean, they did define these Aladi Komaldi groups, but actually what they use in the proof is something more general. So they actually look at Komaldi with coefficients in um, arbitrary sheaves or at least constructible sheaves. Um, so here, I, you know, I was, uh, not really, I will kind of omit this adjective constructible always. And, um, and so you're kind of, you're kind of looking at this whole category of aliadic sheaves. And here I'm also not being precise because this should actually be the derived category. Um, but I will kind of just pretend that, yeah, pretend that it's, it's, there's no difference or whatever. Um, so let, so let me, I mean, I realize it's exactly what you're saying here, but okay. So he, so they started with, uh, you have this thing, we understand, let's say topology and endomorphisms and fixed point formulas. And then there's this vast kind of a crack dream to try to make it work in this case where nothing makes sense. And then you need more. And you're saying that really if it is the cohomology group, but what are the cohomology others? And you need sheaves. I mean, they tell topology is new. It's like that invent that. Invent it, and then invite sheaves on it, and then invent the new kind of sheaves on it, which are variants of things that we are that they already knew about. They're not quite the same thing. And then you're okay. And so these are the things that are forced upon them that look crazy, but they're forced upon us by um, reasonable, uh, well, amazing, miraculous things we observe. But they're forces. Okay, so this is good too. I'm, it, the sheaves are going to be forced on them, please. And uh, I, I want to double check yeah. to see if I understand. The category of analytic sheaves. So I guess one thing that will be in there will be um, the constant sheaf, and then I'll have locally constant sheaves, and then um, yes. I can play games where I have a local um, a locally constant sheaf on an open or closed subscheme, and I push, and I extend that to X, and then I do the derived category, so I can also have complexes. Are there any other important yes. examples that I'm missing? Uh, I mean, that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much everything. I mean, somehow, especially when we put this adjective constructible, which yeah, yeah, really, I should be saying constructible everywhere. And constructible will mean exactly that you have some kind of stratification where, you know, it's, yeah, on each stratum, it's, it, it is basically locally constant sheet. So, you know, it's kind of the situation I said when you have a closed and open. So it's exactly what, you, what you're looking at. So everything is kind of built up out of those, those sheaves in some interesting ways. Yeah. So, so let me see if I can repeat Jesse's question or, or, or what, what both of you are saying, which is, okay, great. So we know. We know about constant sheaves. We know about the tall topology, say. Then we know what locally constant things are. And we know we're going to need a billion category esque things. So we're going to have to do stuff with those and then induce things that are allowed by that. And then this leads to things that we, which we can interpret as constructible sheaves. Because uh, we also want to push forward, you said, and pull back. That makes sense to me, too, under reasonable morphisms. And that forces us to consider more general things, but nothing more general than constructible sheaves, uh, which. Uh, which which we need to define the specific set of that's the that's the setting that's what we're thinking that's what's in our head okay perfect yeah. yeah exactly I mean so maybe an analogy is that if you're you know if you're comfortable with um, coherent cohomology then sort of the analogous object here is uh, I mean the analog of a constructible sheaf in this analytic setting is a coherent sheaf in the you know in the in this um, setting of coherent cohomology somehow like the natural coefficients for coherent cohomology are not just like the structure sheaf, but really like arbitrary um, coherent sheaves, which are sort of, you know, kind of, um, yeah, you can sort of build them up out of um, structure sheaves of, of closed subschemes, but, but they're more, more general. And you kind of, you, if you really want to enjoy the whole theory, you know, everything that the theory has to, to offer you, 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 you really just need to work with, with these more, more general objects. Um, so hopefully this, yeah, I'll try to explain this a bit more. Um, and so, yeah, so anytime you have, so I guess I want, I want to think of this, this thing as a kind of categorification. I mean, this is a, this is a cohomology group and this is one categorical level higher. This is a, you know, a category and um, but it's still some kind of invariant of, of x. Um, so anytime you know if we send x to this guy, the, this this thing enjoys all kind of functorialities. And it's the same thing for this this assignment here. It's not just a bunch of categories, uh, but you know there's all kind of interesting functorialities between them. Which are you know pullback, push forward, and the um, you know the compactly supported versions. 
Um, but what's different from like when we work with cohomology, we just have pullback push forward. Uh, somehow here we have you know, you have these dual operations as well. So this kind of corresponds to the fact that in these categories we can access not just cohomology but also cohomology with compact support in some sense. And these these functorialities correspond more to cohomology with compact support. But because we're working in this setting when we have all you know like every sheaf around, um, the cat you know it's it's kind of big enough that you can actually play with these dualities that the upper star is exchanged with upper shriek, under verdi duality, and, and so on. So similarly with the lower star. So that's the kind of um, useful aspect of this, you know, conceptually speaking. But okay, let's get a bit more concrete. So let's say, you know, the, the target, um, so the most like general case, like I mean, the most sorry, interesting case, like the case that you should be, uh, you know, thinking of when you, when you look at these, these six functors, is is just uh, pushing forward or like the, the projection to to a point, right? So in this case, the, our point is this base base field uh, FP, and so we look at the map FP, and there's always this constant sheaf. So you know this is the the most trivial like sheaf um, that you can that you can look at, and so you can you can look at this guy on on X. Um, but we have two two different ways to push it down here. There's a usual push forward and there's a compactly supported push forward. And if we look at X groups into this guy, that's exactly exactly, you know, basically by definition, that's the allotted cohomology. But if we look at um, the streak functor, that's that's going to give us instead compactly supported uh, cohomology. And in fact. Um, I mean, just to be able to make this definition was, I think, why Brooklyn Deek was sort of adamant about having this this shriek functor, because this is sort of the most you know the most conceptual way to do it. And also, you can think of this shriek functor as a sort of relative version of this um, of this uh, cohomology thing here, cohomology with compact support. So we can not just push forward to to the point, but if you have another thing here, then you could you you could just work with this guy instead. And this is a completely valid thing that you can do. And at the end of the day, you know, so you might try to just prove things up here and then at the end of the day, push forward down here, but you know, you don't need to do that until you're kind of ready to do so. So that idea will come back again uh, a bit later. But, um, and one more thing I wanna mention at this point is that, well, we started with this QL, you know, because we look at this constant sheaf on X, but you could start with any sheaf on X and you could define with the same formulas, just replacing this by this F here, uh, cohomology or cohomology with compact support with coefficients in any in any sheaf. Uh, okay, so that's sort of what the you know what these six functors are buying us for now. Um, and so the the idea of I mean it's really like uh, yeah I, re I really enjoy this sort of growth and Deakian way of thinking here because what he's saying is like, okay, we want to prove something about these zeta functions. But before we do that, let's actually define this like more general thing here, which is like find a zeta function, not just of X, but of any sheaf on X. So now, because what you can do is like, okay, we were before, I mean, the zeta function was something about the action of the Frobenius on cohomology, right? On a lot of cohomology. And now you can look at, um, you can look at, homology with coefficients in F. And here I should really again be looking at X bar and looking at aletic, alet, you know, etyl or aletic homology here. Um, but that's a completely valid valid thing. I mean, for Benius by functoriality, right? Um, I mean, that's the point of all these upper star and lower star functors is that functoriality will give us an action of for on this on this guy here. Actually, here's a, here's a can you go back? There's a question on the, uh, which seems good. Can you go, yes. Uh, so the question was this, so cohomology is about going to the algebraic closure, uh, whereas the thing on the right has no algebraic, the question was uh, the shape. Right, that's a valid question. Yeah, uh, so I think, I mean, we can define, I mean, so here, I mean, how should I say, like, this is a valid, like, um, you know, th this, Guy here is also a valid object of consideration, not and not just this X bar. 
Um, so if we want to, we can we can work with work with this thing. It's just that in the statements that we're interested in here, like the slush just trace formula and so on, those statements are about about this thing. And most of the statements uh, related to this um, to these veil conjectures are about the base change to the algebraic closure, which is why I adopt this um, convention that by default cohomology will, will mean this. Okay. But uh, so it's the same thing with the you know on this categorical side, we could do we could replace x by x bar, but it already makes sense for x itself. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we can we can put bars everywhere on, on both sides, or or we can we can omit them. But when we get back to this situation, that's why we're we're not putting bars here again. And yeah, I should you know I should uh, also put them here as well. Um, but yeah, so so okay, we define this. Um, and okay, I mean, great, you can you can define that, but you know, then what? But the amazing thing is this: um, what they prove is this kind of super general version of this Lipschitz trace formula, which um, yeah, most people attribute to growth in D per Verdier. Growth in D himself in his paper, he kind of he he calls it Verdier's theorem. So, but um, yeah. So anyway, so I mean the. The statement here, like you know, let's focus on this part for now. Uh, the statement is is kind of saying that okay, you have x, um, and now you can look at the zeta function over over the the base f p, and you can you can basically compute this zeta function for f in terms of the zeta functions for these cohomology with cohomology with compact support, and you take the product over all these which are even, and then you take the product all these which are odd. And this, you know, this this is the, the the formula that you get. So this will give you the rationality you want. And you know, because it's just FP. So I mean, the reason I write it this way is because there's actually a more general statement, um, as you can imagine, using just any map. And then we should replace these uh, cohomology groups by these, uh, you know, compact piece of word cohomology should be replaced by this, by this um, compactly supported push forwards. And you know the the i is corresponding to the r i here, so it's kind of the i th cohomology group of that of that uh, complex. Um, and and so if you sort of spell out, I mean, well, this thing is just is just this this guy here. So you know it, it, it's kind of exactly what what you want to prove this um, rationality, but somehow this you know the statement. Um, is in terms of f, and you really want to be able to. I mean, even if we started with the constant sheaf here, I mean, in order to prove this, we would want to be able to do this. You know, this more general sheaf here. We want to take this compactly supported push forward here, and so both the statement and the proof. I mean, really, um, you know, especially the proof really involved this extra generality. I mean, it would be much more difficult to prove this theorem if you if you just put constant sheaf everywhere. Right, it's just um, you just have less room to play around there. Um, so the so the um, right so in this in what's there before. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Wrong. Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> uh, so the so the creature on the left is we have the data of an X. We have an endomorphism which happens to be for uh, and, uh and we have F and we have an equivariant action. On not just x but on f over x, and then from that we get this thing on the right in this Verbenius set. That's our that's the step back. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. And you're and you're sticking yourself and you're restricting yourself to uh, while well, you're extending your f's under consideration to these more general things, but they're not completely general. But it's the setting which allows you. Okay, great. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and so to, to sort of elaborate more a little bit on this um, idea of why this, um, you know, I'm claiming that the, the proof really uses this extra generality. And um, <clears throat> so the idea is is kind of this so-called like Devisage argument, which is, you know, this kind of trademark of all growth index proofs or like, you know, his, his, his most famous proofs are always like this kind of 
uh, long series of reduction steps where at the end it's just like, okay, now you've reduced to some statement that's just completely explicit and you just, you know, you, you can just prove it by hand. But um, so, so what he does here is he reduces to the case of a curve, just a smooth projective curve. Um, but the, the cool thing is that like, you know, you, you start off with, even if you start off with just trying to understand, um, you know, this non-generalized thing, so just the zeta function with no sheaf, which is the same as the zeta function with this constant sheaf. Um, even if we start out trying to understand this, we end up needing to understand, um, you know, the case of curves, but with general sheaves. Um, so that's that's the trick. You can do this reduction at the cost of making your statement more general, um, your initial statement more general, and so. Um, the you know just in just in one sentence like the um sort of the key idea of this reduction is that locally you know like let's say you assume x is affine then you you kind of you map your x onto something lower dimensional locally and then now you use these functorialities to push forward your sheaf onto onto this guy and and, and you know work with that thing so eventually with this, you, you keep uh, reducing the dimension until you get to a curve. So that's a, you know, some kind of, um, yeah, intuition behind the, the proof. Yeah, okay, so now I'm more than halfway into the talk, um, we're like, wait a minute, wasn't this supposed to be talking about motives? And you're just talking about this elliptic homology and um, being a growth ending fanboy. Yeah, well, this is all true. So let's get back to, um i mean so i guess let's assess our situation we've 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 seen that okay all these cool elliptic homology ideas um give us a way to prove like these rationality properties at least almost prove like we still had some issue with this independence of l um but there was also the other um there was also the other you know the other main thing which was this Riemann hypothesis statement and so this is this is from Grothendieck's paper on the standard conjectures um where in 1968 he's he's sort of mentioning this fact that yeah so we we've proven some nice properties but we don't know that these polynomials have integral coefficients and that they're independent of l and we don't know that the eigenvalues of the Frobenius on cohomology of x bar which are basically just the inverses of the of the roots are of the expected absolute value. Um, so that's sort of what what we still need to prove. So at this point, the story diverges into two paths. One of them is the the path of motives, which was conjectural and remains uh, conjectural at least mostly conjectural at this point. And the other path was um, the path that Deline took, which was just like figure out a really clever way to to actually prove the you know to prove these things just using um, just using a lot of cohomology but in like smarter ways um, so we're gonna pretend that that never happened and we're gonna still try to motivate <laughs> motivate the you know these um, motivic ideas um, you know because yeah I, I, anyway I think there's still a lot of value to having this even if you know, even if okay, there are other proofs of the conjectures. But okay, so what is what is a, a motive? So at first path pass, let's think of this as some intermediate object between X and the um the elliptic homology. Um and one feature of this is that it's independent of L. And as we'll see, I mean, as we might discuss a bit later as well, this also recovers, um, you know, Betty cohomology in case X is not defined over a finite field, let's say, but if X is defined over C, then, you know, this, this motive should somehow contain the information of the Betty or the singular cohomology of the complex points. Um, and moreover, like, you know, I won't talk about it too much, but I mean, there's a, there's a Galois action on this thing. I mean, this also should be, X bar. So there's this Gallo, Gallo action here, which is like, so we're, this is not just you know, an abstract algebraic group, an abstract group, um, but 
um, but you know has this extra extra structure. And similarly, the the Betty cohomology, as as I'll mention a bit later, has this extra structure of the, this hot structure. And so this this motive is supposed to contain all of this stuff. So that's the first um, the first thing that we should know about motives. The second thing is that um, it is a kind of linearization. So obviously, when we go from X to the cohomology, that is definitely linearizing. Um, but this thing is also uh, an intermediate linearization. So one way what, we can what, see what, this what, is what, that, do you mean, what do you mean by linearizing? You mean like vector space ish or in a way or a million categories? Yeah, ex exactly. We turn we turn something like continuous into something like you know like a just a linear algebra, right? We go from geometry to to linear algebra, basically. Um, that's sort of what cohomology, you know, cohomology is like, I think, you know, we think of cohomology as some kind of functor from geometry or topology to, to yeah, algebra, like vector spaces. And essentially motives are supposed to be like the, some kind of universal linearization basically. Um, and so one way to sort of see this, you know, some small part of this is um, that if we look at dimension zero things, well, there's a Galois correspondence between, um, if you have a field K, if you have finite etale schemes over K, there's a Galois correspondence between finite G sets, which is an absolute Galois group. Now, if we linearize this, what do we get? Well, we get vector spaces. So if we look at finite dimensional vector space over Q, say, uh, again, with some continuous action of the Galois, absolute Galois group, then you might want to fill in the blank here. Like what is, you know, what is the, you know, what, what should we put here? And it turns out the, the answer that, you know, so this, this is a non-conjectural statement that's not difficult to prove if you define motives in the right way, that motives, the category of motives of finite itself schemes over K, the so-called Artin motives, is equivalent to this category. So this is, and this is a commutative diagram here. So your, your um, Q, should that be QL? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, no, I th here is it, it should definitely not be QL because okay. here we kind of, yeah, we don't want to ever choose, choose any L. So all this, this motivic thing, part of the, you know, part of the um, idea of this thing is that we should never have to choose, choose L. In fact, I mean, this is an arbitrary field, so it could be, um, you know, there's no, like, it's not defined. We're not just working over finite field anymore. I mean, for this slide, at least. Um, yeah, so I think this is, you know, and, and, and so one, I mean, one, you know, this is not, I'm not going to go into this direction, but one motivation for motives also, one thing Berkeley was trying to do is, is sort of think of um, higher dimensional motives or motives of higher dimensional, like, schemes or, you know, motives in general as some kind of, um, you know, higher dimensional version of, of Galois theory in some sense. And so that, that leads you, that line of thinking leads you or led him to the idea of the motivic Galois group and motivic Galois theory. But um, yeah, that's sort of uh, a different story, which I won't talk about here. Um, so if we if we go back, if we remember back to this whole stuff about Jacobians, well, one thing um, that I won't say precisely here, but you know, the basically there's a very precise sense in which the the motive of a curve is you know essentially completely controlled by the Jacobian. It's essentially the same data. The, the motive of the curve and the Jacobian is is essentially the same same thing in some sense. So that's that's a good sign as well. That was sort of. Um, you know, because the other motivation um, that Groth and had was that motive should be some kind of, um, let's say, the yeah, higher dimensional analogs of Jacobians. Like we want to be able to make sense of this um, for any X. Are you thinking and, about the Jacobian as a, a principally polarized abelian variety or just an abelian variety? Yeah. yeah, the principal polarization is is uh, is relevant at some point. I mean, it's it's yeah. So that's also relevant in the proof of the of this Riemann hypothesis statement, actually, because the the principal polarization is actually what gives you this um, 
this uh, involution on the endomorphisms. So, yeah. Um, so that that's okay. So that's the other thing about you know about motives, and then um, sort of now I want to like go back to the, to the beginning of yeah we 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 real, we realized or we remembered uh, Bale's observation that you know this this set that we're trying to count I should say the cardinality of the set. Um, is this intersection number, but the, the set is the, the fixed points of this Frobenius. And okay, the fixed points uh, just means, okay, you take the graph of your endomorphism and you intersect it with the diagonal inside it, x times x, right? This is just a weird way of saying the same thing. Um, so, but okay, it's kind of, we, we formulated this in some kind of, in terms of some kind of intersection theory. Okay, so, so now, I mean, I think this was sort of the direct motivation for. And that was left jet's fixed point formula. Yeah. So exactly that. Yeah, exactly. That's why. That's why we're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, but so the other the other reason is that, I mean, left jet's fixed points formula tells us that this is the kind of thing we want to understand. Um, and so what Grothendieck did was like. He actually went in the other direction and sort of defined this category of motives as um, as sort of I mean I don't know how to say it exactly but like in such a way that these these things would like just naturally appear in there. Um, okay, and so what what I mean by that is is the following. So if we have two smooth projective varieties over over a field K, we can look at the abelian group of so-called correspondences, which means you take, first of all, you take um, algebraic cycles of co-dimension, dimension of X, meaning, you know, these are, uh, this is a free abelian group, well, free Q vector space, um, generated by, yeah, sub-varieties of this product with the appropriate co-dimension. And modulo, let's, I mean, yeah, let's say numerical equivalence. Um, Meaning that okay, if you intersect your two things with with anything else, it gives you the same number. Um, and yeah, you can compose these things. So let's say if you have alpha and beta in x times y, alpha is in x times y, beta is in y times z. Then you can pull back, so you pull back to the product, pull back to the product. Um, take the intersection on here and then push it forward. To x times z, so you take this push forward. So that gives you a way to get a new correspondence on, on this thing. So this defines a category where the these are the objects. These are the morphism sets. So hom is equal to the to this thing, and this is the this uh, this is the composition law. Okay. Um, so this is like a first approximation to to motives. Um, essentially, what you want to do um, is Take this category and then force idempotence to split here. Um, so basically, what that means, you know, there's there's some categorical procedure called uh, pseudo abelian uh, pseudo abelian envelope or something. But I mean, basically, what it means is that um, you should think of a motive as sort of by definition some kind of piece or like a part of some variety, like a linear linearized part, because we we did this whole you know, linearization process. I mean, the linearization is encoded by the fact that, I mean, we're looking at Q vector spaces here. So it's some kind of linear piece of a variety, which is cut out by a correspondence in some sense. Um, yeah, I hope that that makes some, some sense. But yeah, I think next, next week, hopefully that will be uh, clarified more. Yeah, so anyway, now, okay, now, um, Ruthen, you define this category of, um, yeah, motives, or I should say pure motives. Um, mixed motives, we'll see a bit later, which is something that's still, still undefined, still conjectural. But these, these pure motives are, are defined, and Ruthen, you wanted to use this to try to 
um, prove the remaining part of the, the wave conjectures. And yeah, he ran into some problems with algebraic cycles. I mean, when you put algebraic cycles into your definition of motives, and then you try to use, you know, you try to prove something, try to lift some statement from cohomology to the level of motives. Um, it's not too surprising uh, that you run into some some questions about algebraic cycles, and it turns out some questions about algebraic cycles are extremely difficult. Um, so he isolated two properties that um, that he he would want. So the first the first conjecture was a he called it a Lefschetz type conjecture. So I won't I won't give you the precise statement, but you know the the reason for that conjecture is that he wanted to be able to implement this proof, this rationality proof that we saw in elliptic homology um, at the level of motives instead of just elliptic homology. And if you try to do that argument, you're going to run into this kind of Lefschetz type conjecture. And the second uh, the second thing is a Hodge type conjecture which is uh, saying that the, yeah, the, for any motive, endomorphisms of that motive should admit uh, an involution that's positive definite. So if you remember back to Wave's proof using, you know, for a way of conjecture for curves using this Jacobian, um, he was saying that, you know, for a curve, you, you have this property for, for the Jacobian. And, you know, this, you know, as I said before, like for, the motive of a curve is basically the, the Jacobian. So this is kind of reasonable from that standpoint. And um, that just was, to make sure I'm on the same wavelength. So a priori um, end of M, um, that's just a Q vector space? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a Q vector space. Um, Yeah, probably that's just a few vector space. I'm sorry, so I'm presumably it should admit a positive definite involution. Uh, it's just a key vector space. So presumably you want some connection with geometry as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't remember the yeah, I don't remember the exact formulation, but um, yeah, it should be something like this, but Maybe, yeah, maybe I'm missing something here. Um, Sorry, what's a positive definite involution mean? So just an involution like um, whose, yeah, trace in some sense is positive definite, I guess, something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, for now, let's just say the details of well, this are not important, but uh, basically, we. Um, I mean, this is also not the statement of of the of the the conjecture. This is just some sort of supposed to be some consequence. Like if you make this precise, whatever it means, this thing should should imply this um, should imply this property. And then if you go back to this uh, to Leia's argument here. Yeah, basically, growth and is just trying to like use the same strategy to like. I mean, it's it's it, it, yeah. You you kind of um, isolate this this sort of statement as like okay, if you have some something here where like the cohomology or the motive has this analogous property, then you can derive this Riemann hypothesis, some kind of standard argument, um, and so. Basically, the you know the standard conjectures are supposed to be the conjectures that would let you make this argument um, precisely. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's one example I want to mention, which is due to Manin. Uh, it's kind of right after Grothendieck really defined these these uh, these motives, these pure motives. Um, I mean, he didn't even publish anything about them yet. So Monin's paper is kind of one of the first um, first papers where you actually see a definition of, of these pure motives. And um, what he realized is actually like you can use this this thing to show that for any you know if you work over any field, not just a finite field. 
then you can actually um, prove some, yeah, this uh, Riemann hypothesis statement for unirational threefolds, um, which I think in some some cases of like uh, some cubic hypersurfaces in P4 was already proven by probably Bombieri and, and someone. And yeah, so th this is kind of cool argument that he, I mean, he just uses this um yeah and then the main input is the kind of he, he sort of lifts the blow up formula in cohomology so the, the formula for the cohomology of a blow up he lifts that to the motive and sort of use that to understand like birational transformations at the level of motives and and so that 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 this argument doesn't rely on any any uh conjectures actually so that's that, that's sort of nice um yeah, okay, so so now uh, I want to move on to the last couple of minutes. Um, this notion of, I mean, this notion of motives that we've been discussing so far is sort of the just, it's kind of the easy part of motives. It's a, the pure part. So that's the part that, that, you know, is actually defined. So this is the category of pure motives. And so these are the motives of some projective varieties. And um, what, yeah, what, what you really want is, I mean, to remove this word projective. And so this is called the, the category of mixed motives. And I should say like this does not exist so far. Um, not known, I mean, let's just say conjectural. Okay, and um, there, you know, there is something, you know, sort of the derived category of that is non-conjectural. That's what, what I'll, uh, discuss next time, but you know the the you know the hypothetical abelian category um, of which that triangulated category should be the draft category is is not actually defined. Um, so so what is this mixed motive thing supposed to do? Well, so as I briefly mentioned before, if x is smooth projective, then this motive m of x in this category, this pure motive, is supposed to recover the hot structure on on the Betty cohomology. So the cohomology, singular cohomology of the complex points. But what Deline, Deline realized is that if you have an arbitrary um, variety over the complex numbers, there's still some um, generalization of hot, hot structure, some like more fancy version of a hot structure that exists on the, on the, the Betty cohomology. So whatever that thing is, is called a mixed hot structure. And so, yeah, so basically you can think of this as kind of motives with weights. But this category is like so much more, um, I mean, so much richer than, than this one. The analogy that you can think of is maybe, I mean, these are like, this word projective here is a kind of funny coincidence because these are really some kind of projective objects in some sense in, the, in this, you know, in the, at least in the derived category of motives. Like there's no interesting X groups here. Um, whereas here you have all kinds of interesting information about algebraic cycles and algebraic K theory as X groups, I mean, conjecturally, in some sense conjecturally. Um, and so this is like, that's also why this is so much more difficult to define. But um, yeah, so I guess I wanna end with the um, Balenson's conjecture on motivic sheaves, which I hope now we can appreciate most of the statement. Um, so this is from his paper in 1985, which I've uh, pasted the original, um, you know, it's always fun to see the original. I wish it was like typewritten better, but it's always nice to see the, the sort of the original uh, writing here. And so let's, let's go through it, I guess. Um, so, what he's saying is that for any scheme S, um, you know, let's ignore this coefficient ring. Let's say we're always working with rational coefficients. There should be this abelian category of mixed motivic sheaves. Um, and there should be the corresponding derived category. So this is the sort of motivic analog of this thing, which, which I had just written as sheaf of X before. Um, and so that was, you know, I was kind of hiding the QL coefficients there. 
But now this is a kind of fancier thing, which will uh, m of x, let's say. So there will be a functor here, but um, the behavior of these categories is very, it's very similar to to these ones. So yeah, there's a. I mean, I was talking about the six-point formalism, but I didn't mention like the obvious functors. So there's a tensor and in, in the home. I mean, they're they're kind of a bit boring. I mean, they're definitely important, but um, <laughs> sometimes you forget to mention them. But sort of the the most important six functors are are these ones. And so what Balenson is saying is that okay, the, these should actually lift. Uh, these should actually lift to the to this level. Uh, sorry, from this level to to this derived category of motives. Um, there's some Tate twist as well. Um, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't explain this in the in this setting, but I mean there's Tate twist here too, and these are sort of supposed to lift those. And then um, and then we should have some kind of weight filtration here. Um, yeah, and so so all these things should behave the same way as in the mixed elliptic situation, and then one should have realization functors from these categories to these elliptic ones, and to yeah some kind of Hodge realization as well. Um, so yeah, so the, it's very in some sense in retrospect, it's kind of not very surprising that this should exist. But it's also extremely ambitious because I mean, for I mean, if S is just spec of K, we don't know how to we still don't know how to define that. So Balenson is saying like I mean, not only does he want that exist just for spec K, but this should exist for over any any scheme and have all these like six month formalisms, highly non-trivial stuff. And um, yeah, and so I guess hopefully in in this talk we've seen why um you know why this motivic aspect would be useful and also why like this shifi thing would be useful i mean the just the sort of the power that you have when you have all these functors and you can do amazing um reduction arguments or devisage arguments you know when you work with these more gen more general statements with arbitrary sheaves or in this case arbitrary motives i mean this is just so so powerful and um, I hope, yeah, I hope we've, see, we've seen that a bit. So I guess now that we've seen this statement, next time I'll explain um, the sort of the, that we have this kind of next best thing to this conjecture, which is Wojewski's work constructing this DM, which is this derived category. So that's the goal for next time. So can I ask with this? Okay, this is great. This is preempted. So Novotsky has preempted everything. I, uh, but so in what Johnson said, there's no, um, he's not like, if we wanted to follow, look for what he's looking for, he's not, he says there's something, this category of perverse sheaves. So this isn't sheaves on a, like we shouldn't be looking for a topology uh, and anything like sheaves on the topology. Uh, it's just the category we're looking for. There's like, no, he's not saying, like it, it's a red herring to try to guess what the right topology is necessarily, although topologies will come up. Instead, it's just the category we're looking for. And the resulting thing should have, so there is an abelian category. It's not just the derived triangular category. He's looking for, he's like somewhere out there or some, or maybe where Vodsky's answer is screw the abelian category, screw the derived category that we want anyway, perhaps. Uh, and it's the derived category is the thing we're looking for. And the abelian category would, maybe let us split off pieces and talk about the pieces, but the derived category might in the end be all we can hope to get, uh, but it'll, uh, is that is that the lesson? Or maybe you'll say more next time, uh, or you want- Yeah, want um, I'll probably say more next time, but yeah, I mean, you could you could take that as a lesson. Um, I mean, I think we still hope to have the, we definitely still hope to have the reading category. I mean, yeah, I mean, Wojewski is probably not saying that we don't care about the abelian category and the draft category is good enough. It's it's just that okay, it's good enough for some things. Um, it's yeah. and it's not good enough for other things. Like, you know, so for example, like once you have this draft category, you can reformulate the question of constructing an abelian category as there should be a T structure on this triangular category where the abelian, you know, that hypothetical abelian category is the heart of this T structure, and um, so that's so called, you know, that's a conjectural motivic T structure. And, um, you know, so for example, like Balenson has proven that if you have 
the motility structure, then you can actually, um, you know, then you can, you can actually prove the standard conjecture. So you can derive the standard conjectures on algebraic cycles just from the T structure, you know, the conjectural T structure on the, on um, DM, on the derived category motives. Right. So that's kind of really surprising in the sense that, I mean, in some sense it shouldn't be surprising, but in some sense it's surprising because when I, when you see the definition of DM, of derived category of motives, I mean, yeah, it's a bit, um, I mean, it's, it's technically involved, but it's, it's kind of technically in the sense of like technical homological algebra and no, it doesn't look like there's that much like geometric input, I guess, in some sense. But then somehow just from like this T structure, somehow this T structure is just encoding something, you know, really non-trivial, the existence of that T structure and the fact that it's non-degenerate and things like this. Um, just from, from that, you can, you can extract these properties of algebraic cycles that we, we have not been able to prove for like 60 or whatever, 50 years. Um, so I think like part of, part of the thing is like, okay, well, yeah, we can't, you know, the, the full story of motives is just out of reach and, you know, someone else will need to come along in the future and, you know, shed some light on, on that. But the, just like, I guess what his point, point is like, just having this, you know, DM gives you some, some things um, after all. It's, you know, it's not, it's not everything, but it, you know, you, you can actually do some interesting things there and, so actually a lot of the work in motivic, you know, in motivic homotopy theory, for example, or, you know, in, in motives in general these days, you know, from the category, like people that work on triangulated categories of motives, like DM, they're not really most of the time thinking that much about these original questions about, you know, like the zeta functions or, or things like that. But um, there's a, a whole another side of, of this, which is like intersection theory and K-theory and Cobordism and all these interesting other cohomology theories like this, which are like these days kind of more of a focus. Um, and you know, all kind of other things people are do, doing in what to become what to be theory. So it's sort of like, yeah, okay, we we can't prove these original things about, you know, about you know zeta functions or algebraic cycles, but but you can, you know, you can do, I mean, one thing that this DM lets you do is kind of gives you a shifty kind of way of studying. Um, like child groups and intersection theory, which is kind of like, you know, it's 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 almost like as you said, there, it's not like you know, motivic cohomology is not just cohomology and some appropriate topology, but but still, it's it's it, you know, the but, way but, you work uh, with it. But it, you still uh, think of it, you think of it as shifty still. Like it's not just some abstract triangulated category. You maybe you yeah. think of it as despite the lack of a, or maybe in that case exactly. Um, it still has that flavor. It has that. Uh, exactly. I mean, I would say it's because the six, the existence of these six functors, which which we do have, um, because anyway, those are things which only only exist at the derived category level. Even in the Italo setting, in order to get the you know these exceptional functors, you have to go derived. And you know, once you go derived and you have these six six functors, you're really just like, I mean, you're just, you know, you're working with cohomology, some kind of cohomology theory. You know, it's it's like. Yeah, basically you have everything you have in the Aladic derived category except for the T structure. Um, sure. So now the game is like, what can you prove without the T structure? Or like, what you know, what, can you find some alternative arguments that avoid the use of the T structure and so on? Um, I guess if you eventually prove every, <laughs> if you prove every possible statement that um, you know without using the T structure, then in some sense you've proven that the T structure uh, must exist, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> in some sense. So the, the you know the, you get closer and closer to to you know, more and more evidence for for the T structure to actually exist, and so that that's the kind of game that a lot of people are playing now. And in this world, is sort of just just kind of pretend that this is a derived category of sheaves, and and extract statements about child groups, higher child groups, algebraic case theory, things like that. Terrific! Ah, uh, great. Okay, good. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I should let you conclude before people ask questions, but I wanted to also ask Claude's question. So. Is oh, it? yeah, no, I guess that was, uh, yeah, I, was, I meant to stop there anyway, so, yeah. Actually, before then, other people would ask questions, we can unmute ourselves and thank, thank you for a great, a great, great <laughs>